This is a Bible discussion where we take the time to see what God's Word of Truth has in store for us. Today is a special, special discussion. Mr. Stan Isbell from Houston, Texas will be joining us. And Stan will be sharing with us some personal experiences about how he grew to love the Word of Truth and how he's put God's Word of Truth into practice in his life. Our guest today is Mr. Stan Isbell from Houston, Texas. Stan, welcome to our program. Thank you very much, Mark. It's wonderful to be here. And I hope that what we have brought to the program and to your viewers will be based especially upon the Word of God, but also with a smattering of personal experience, which takes us back to the 60s. Yeah. Stan, I think it's really important. And what I'd like to do to get us started here is take a look at a verse in the, in the New Testament that will really kind of become our theme. We're going to go through a series of four different discussions from this verse. Um, this kind of be an introduction today with this class, and then three mm -hmm. follow-up classes that will help fill out our discussion in considerable more detail. But I think it's helpful to start with this verse as, if you will, our theme, our theme verse. Right. And I'm in uh, 1 John uh, chapter 2 at verse 15, where there's somewhat of a negative thought presented to us. But I think by the time we finish with our discussions that you'll help us see that there really is a very positive and a very strong message from our, our Heavenly Father behind these words. And I'm going to read um, from the Revised Standard Version, starting at verse 15 of 1 John 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the, of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And in, in those Two or three short verses is the message for these four classes. Now, you and I were talking prior to starting the program, and you told us that you had a story that you think would be useful in taking this message and getting us started in understanding what it means. So why don't you share that story with us? I'd like to. Thanks, Mark. I want the viewer to imagine a little leaf uh, shining in the light with a little red fruit hanging beneath it. Suddenly the leaf begins to shake violently, and as we sort of pan back, we start to see the branch, the leaf is on, falling off the tree. And then suddenly we see the tree being hacked away, hacked away with people, 15, 20 people around, hacking away at the branches of this tree. So we walk up to one of the people and we ask them, say, why, why in the world are you hacking away at this tree? And the man says to us, well, look at the tree. It's full of fruit that's bitter to the taste. The leaves are poisonous and it's full of thorns that pop our children's toy balls and, and our children step on these thorns that fall from the trees. And so we come out here every year. We've done this all my life and all my father's life and all my grandfather's life, all the way back several generations. Each year we come out and we cut the branches off of this tree. So we ask the individual, well, why don't you just dig down to the roots of the tree, kill the roots, cut the roots, pull the tree over, cut it up, drag it away, and burn it. And that way you'll be rid of your problem. And the man turns to us and says, oh, no, we couldn't ever do that. We employ too many people every year by this tree. It provides great income for us. Well, in spite of the few injuries and, and even some deaths from eating of the fruit, nonetheless, it provides great revenues. We could never cut down this tree each year. It brings us together in wonderful <laughs> fellowship and it provides money for the townspeople. So what do we do? Turn around and say, go figure. Yeah, <laughs> very good, Stan. That, um, you know, there's so many things in life where that story uh, would, would fit. And I know you well enough to know that you wouldn't just tell us a story for the sake of a story. <laughs> so there's a moral behind this, right? What's Indeed. the moral of this story? You know, we do this same thing. We might think it foolish of these people to be hacking away at the branches. And, and we've all heard the moral of the story. Better is one man digging at the roots of a problem than a thousand men hacking away at the branches. Well, our problem today in society are numerous. They're multitude. We have so many social ills, and I've experienced many of those in my own life as a child, and I'm sure the viewers and you yourself have experienced them, your own children. Uh, there are so many. We, we couldn't uh, enumerate on all of them, but really they're just the branches and the leaves bearing thorns. And divorce rate, drug abuse, crime, 
uh, famines. It grows from personal problems to family problems to communal problems to society, state, society, international. And the world around us. And but what's really the becomes. root? And I think it's right where you went to in Scripture, yeah. Mark. It's, and, I, and I think that's an important point, though, is that when we when we think of your story and the moral of the story is let's get to the root of the problem, mm -hmm. we have to step back as uh, men and women who believe in a God, who believe that God's revealed to us His Word of Truth through the Scriptures. We have to step back and believe that the root cause or the the discussion, the answer to the root problems, is mm -hmm. given to us by God. Right. And the way God reveals Himself to us is through His Word of Truth. His word. That's exactly right. And that's why we're here. This is a This Is Your Bible series, and the Word of God is the reality. I once had a woman tell me after she had lost her, her son who had overdosed on drugs uh, two years ago, uh, and her husband went out on her and, and brought a young woman into the house, which ended, of course, in divorce for sure. her and her husband. And uh, and she was in, and she went into psychological treatment, psychoanalysis, and she's uh, taking therapy now. She one of the first conversations she's told me, she said, "I need a new reality." And I said, "Oh, I've got just the thing for you, a new reality." And that's what the Word of God gives us. It is the reality. You know, we're living in a dream. We're living in a delusion that has been built. It's been fabricated by man and society. You know, it's just like Hollywood. You know, they fabricate a scene and they put in the actors to give them the scripts. Well, real life is much the same. And this delusion is causing us to lose touch with the reality that God provides for us in His Word. Yeah, and, that, and that's really important because it becomes a very personal issue. Yes, because I think for each one of us, um, it's difficult to admit that we might be living in something other than a reality-based oh, yeah. life. And we work hard day in and day out to try to make a difference in what we do as as, uh, as mothers and fathers raising children, trying to be sure that we're raising them to be good people. Right. And you and I know that in our context that we're trying to raise them to be God-fearing um, children as well. Exactly. So when we're looking around for authority to tell us, well, what does it take to be a good mother or father? Mm -hmm. What does it take to be um, to, to live in this society as, as a good citizen? What is it? Um, we go back to what we had just mentioned, that it's the authority of the Bible that we need to go back to. Exactly. To really establish what's right, what's wrong, what should we do, what shouldn't we do, mm -hmm. um, what's the principles for godly living. And, and one idea to that end, uh, Mark, is that in Proverbs, if you'd turn with me there to Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Oh, the book of Proverbs alone will give an individual so many wonderful uh, commandments, authority, uh, uh, very authoritative verses on how to live your life. It'll be a much better life if we could just apply the book of Proverbs. But if we read verse 18, uh, and I'm reading from the King James Authorized Version, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And I wondered if uh, what version you have there is the RV. Yeah, or? it's helpful, I think, Stan, when you say that, is to read from different versions yeah. because sometimes we get just a little bit of a different nuance in what's right. being said exactly. that hopefully will apply a little bit more personally mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it is, it's, it's the exact same thought. Mm -hmm. It's God's truth. It's the same message mm -hmm. from whichever version you're reading from. But in this case, um, there's just a little bit of a nuance that's different here. Mm -hmm. The Revised Standard Version says in verse 18, where there is no prophecy, and, you're, and the King James said vision, vision right. so where there is no prophecy, the people cast off restraint. Right. And it kind of makes me think of um, a situation like a Mardi Gras where there are no rules anymore. We do whatever right. we want. We do what we want, when we want, the way we want. Right. There is no authority anymore. There's no right or wrong. It's yeah. just what I want at the time. Mm. And so what this is saying is where there's no prophecy, where there's no vision, mm -hmm. people cast off restraint but blessed is he who keeps the law. And, and we clearly understand that the law there is God's law that's been given to us, revealed to us through the Holy Scriptures. And that's exactly right. Prophecy separates the Word of God, the Bible, from all writings of men. The word holy is just a word meaning separate. And Bible is from a Latin word meaning paper. So, but it's a separate book, and prophecy is what makes this book so unique. And if it weren't for prophecy, we wouldn't know what was coming down the line, and, and we wouldn't be able to prepare ourselves. 
But in these last days, and we truly believe that the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is up on us, we need to be a people prepared, covered for that inevitability and that imminent return of Jesus Christ. You notice it says in verse 17, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Well, I know a lot of parents who are in dire straits and great difficulties in trying to correct their son. And at one time in my own life, my own parents, my, were, who were both educators, that my dad was the uh, school superintendent when I was in the sixth grade through the ninth grade, and uh, of a very small school, so I visited his office quite often, and uh, <laughs> and he used uh, the board of education <laughs> quite frequently on me, and I had an older brother who did everything Dad wanted him to do for the most part, and a younger sister, so I was a middle child. Okay. And uh, I'm 51, although I know I look 29, and uh, I'd like you know. No I'd like comment to... on that. <laughs> no, I didn't think you would. But uh, I had a, a different appearance altogether at one time after, um, uh, after I graduated high school. I played in the garage rock and roll band the whole nine yards, and some people call me an extrovert. Um, but I broke away from this authority uh, and this correction of my authoritarian, authoritarian dad and, and my educrat edu mom. But I'd like to show you a picture, if I could. And uh, it might, it, I don't know if it'll ruin my credibility or not, but this, this happened, uh, I guess this is back in 71, and uh, this is my, uh, my wife, who, my sister wife now, uh, Wendy, and, um, and myself, and I know I look a little bit different, my hair is a little bit longer than it is now. And, uh, but I was thinking more about the difference in color. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, the, uh, the colors change quite a bit. But the, uh, the difference in that, that's an angry young man there, and uh, he's, he's a, what you might call a rebel, and uh, really bucking authority back in the 60s. And uh, we remember those days, the Vietnam War and the sure. uh, Democratic Convention in Chicago, and Mayor Daley and the police and the young people and, and uh, Woodstock and all of those. And it was just a, a very upheaval in our society here in the United States and even all over the world. It was like a revolution in the Beatles and Rolling Stones and the rock music and the drugs. And it was just a bucking of authority. But you know, we really didn't have a direction and, and a place to go. And I think the vision that we speak of here and that God speaks, of, speaks to us of in Proverbs 29, that vision, that prophecy, ultimately the purpose of God, Mark, is to cover the earth with his glory. Right. And that glory is a moral excellence. So we're dealing with moral excellence here as the glory of God demonstrated, manifested, displayed, in the people of the earth all over the world. And what we're talking about, and let's go back, is we our, our general theme is about God in control of your life mm -hmm. um, and what you've shared with us, and, and we appreciate that, the fact that you've been willing to share a very personal um, aspect of your life and, and a change from what you were to what you are. And, and I think you would agree that that change has been driven by the Word of God. Oh, absolutely. It's by coming back to the authority of God as, as revealed to us through the Scriptures that has allowed that change. It really has. And, and that's really the message, the key message to get us started in our four-part series is this is the Word of God. This is where that authority comes from. Without it, uh, what we read here is people cast off restraint, mm -hmm. and, and right. which is really what you're described in a very personal way oh, from absolutely. where you were to where you are. You see, my mom, she, she was a dedicated Bible student. She read us the Bible every morning of our life. Every time we woke up, got, came to the table, we received the bread of the Word before we ever put a bite of food in our mouth. Every single morning. We were, uh, we were Southern Baptists. We attended church every Wednesday night, every Sunday, every Sunday night. Royal Ambassadors, Girls Auxiliary. They were dedicated to bringing up children in the way they should go, that when they are old, they will not depart from it. And so you can imagine they were beside themselves when, when their son gets arrested uh, and and uh, for for possession of marijuana, uh, one of the first busts down in uh, uh, Brazoria County, and uh, he's thrown in jail right after uh, Dad had gotten his picture in the paper for establishing a new junior college down there in the area. With my sister being one of the students, the following week his son is uh, one of the five arrested for possession. And wow. uh, yeah, it really hurt. Yeah. I mean, it really hurt him, and this hurts me to look back and think that I hurt 
them. Sure. But as young people, we don't think about that. We're so right. self-driven, self-gratification, self-motivation. Uh, everything is for self, self-centeredness, you know, and we don't think about how we're hurting our parents and our and our brothers and sisters, or our friends, our church members. We don't think about that. We, we, and we're sort of unconscious. We're almost dead mentally to others around us, you know. So it's really important yeah. that we look forward to the vision. And we look forward to the vision. And the other part, which I think we need to touch on briefly, is how we have some personal responsibility in Absolutely. that. Absolutely. You know, we were we were talking about looking at the verse in James. Mm -hmm. uh, the, Good one to turn to. Yeah, the, in the New Testament, James chapter 1. Right. And there's a very important set of verses there that uh, helps us understand that as we're thinking about giving God control of our lives, that we are we're thinking about um, getting under God's authority, right. some of the things that help us understand how to do that. Correct. So how to take on personal responsibility. Right. I was thinking of uh, James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, where it says, Blessed is the man who endures trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And, you know, and that, that's just a wonderful thought in itself because it gives us hope for the future, right. this crown of life, um, and, and we can uh, expound on that at length as for to sure. as what the, how wonderful that will be. But let's just leave it at that phrase for now, as crown of life. Let no one say, verse 13, when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And that's the beginning of what we mean when we say personal responsibility. Right. Um, then desire, when it gives, has give, conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. So it's not somebody else, something else, some other thing causing me to sin. It's me. That's right. No, we cannot create a dichotomy or a diversion away from personal responsibility. I believe Christianity has made a serious mistake, whether intentional or not in attributing these social ills, personal ills, and responsibility for all of these evils of society to a personified devil. Mm -hmm. The scriptures tell us clearly that that devil is really just a personification of our own fleshly thinking, our carnal mind, that is easily drawn away. And you know that word in the King James, or in the original Greek, to be dragged away. Let no man say when he's tempted, and I am tempted of God, uh, I'm sorry, go down to uh, verse 14. 14. Right. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away. That word is like grabbing an animal by a net and dragging him out of his lair. So our animal instincts of lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life are really what drag us across the line of God's law and into that area where we become so enticed that we lose the power to resist. We are such weak creatures. And then when we fail, we say, huh, well, I was only human all the way up to the leadership of this nation in the past. I'm only human. We use that as an excuse, right. but it's a brainless, mindless excuse. The fact is true. We are only human. Yeah. We've got to get way, way beyond that. Yeah, we were created, though. You see, that's the whole point of going back to the beginning. And, I, and I'd like to, to share with you some ideas. You know, we, we see all this social ill. I don't want to make a big deal of this, but uh, notice this this PowerPoint, uh, or this point, this um, uh, illustration on addictions. Uh, it, came, it recently came out of a Newsweek magazine. There are 11 million Americans that uh, use marijuana on a monthly basis, or, or daily basis, perhaps monthly, but tobacco, 47 million, 430,000 die annually from addiction to tobacco. There's 14 million drug users, 14 million alcoholics, and a cost to society of $300 billion annually. And those are absolutely staggering numbers to think, think that. Think of what we could use that money you for. You bet. Sure. And in the context of what we're talking about with um, stepping under the authority of God mm -hmm. and taking personal responsibility for our own lives, um, each one of us has to know that we can keep ourselves out of that statistics if we will apply these principles that we're looking at. That's the key. By nature, by human nature, which we were in a sense, afflicted with from the beginning, our parents. The Bible t takes us all the way back to Genesis and shows us that, that that verse you read in 1 John 2 about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life had its origins in our parents, Adam and Eve. Right. When Eve looked at the tree, it's back in Genesis let's, uh, chapter Let's look 3. at that because I think it's, it's useful to, to 
uh, tie the first John verse to here, as well as the verse that we read in James, because Agreed. you know James gave us, if you will, a formula that leads mm -hmm. to sin. It does, right? And uh, in Genesis, we have an example, the very first example, right. where that formula was applied. So that becomes something where we can know from our scripture, that's a truth. Exactly. That is what's going to happen to you and I, as well as it happened to, uh, to Eve to and Eve. to Adam. And so when you read in Genesis chapter 3, verse uh, 5, the dialogue between the serpent, which was an animal that was created very good along with everything else. There is no no scriptural basis for the idea of the serpent being a puppet in the hands of a fallen angel. That's all Greek mythology, in my opinion. I believe it's based upon the Word of God. But we see this dialogue of the voice of this serpent, which was an expression of the carnal mind, the beastly mind that Paul brings out in Romans so beautifully. This dialogue was such that the serpent believed what he was saying, not trying to connive and scheme and make Eve fall, but he believed what he said because of his observations of the dialogue going on between Adam and Eve and the powerful Elohim, the angels representing God in the, in the garden. And when, verse 5, the serpent says, and we might go back to 4, the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die, when God in fact had told them that they Just would the die. Just the opposite. Exactly. Then he says in verse 5, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, did eat, gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So consequently, they were cursed to die. And, they, and death was afflicted upon them, as God said. They didn't die in that very day, but they died over a period of hundreds of years. But we, you, uh, me, sorry for interrupting no, sure, you there. Uh, but what I wanted to do was to be very clear. We said that this ties to the the verse in James as well as into First John. So let's let's make that tie yep. um, real Good. clearly, if you would, Stan. That verse in in Second or First John chapter two. If you if you still have your hand there and James, you'll notice that Eve, when she saw the tree, it was good for food. That is indeed a lust of the flesh, which John brings out in his verse. Lust, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Also, that it was pleasant to the eyes. And we go back to John, 1 John 2, uh, verse 16, and the lust of the eyes. And then finally, the pride of life was, in, was uh, involved in this temptation when she saw that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. Now, everybody wants education. Their universities are full of young people wanting education. But is it a knowledge of God? Does it take them back to the original creation where God created us with a purpose? No. Evolution is a theory that is, uh, is absolutely broken in its process of reasoning, and there's such a discontinuity there. It has no hope, no true beginnings, no noble beginnings from a pool, uh, a primal pool, uh, as opposed to the creation of God. So you have these three channels of sin. Good for food, lust of the flesh, pleasing to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She wanted to be equal to the gods, or equal to the Elohim, the mighty angels who were they were in fellowship with. And consequently, those desires have now been made deceitful because of the lie of the serpent. So we've got then that tie, that direct tie between um, the theme verse, if we will, that we're going to follow here in our classes mm -hmm. in, um, in Eve. Now, Stan, we're running short on time, so I need <laughs> you at this point to, to give us a summary. So how did we get from a story of some branches on a tree and a tree being chopped down um, to this discussion about Adam and Eve? Summarize, if you would, for us. Human beings were made in the image and likeness of God. We were made with a wonderful design to become very, very powerful creatures of the universe, celestial beings. We were designed as uh, Adam and Eve as prototypes to become a multitude of men and women empowered with immortality and the energy of God and to cover and make this planet perfect. Very good. It fails. We failed in the sin of Eve through temptation and lust and breaking the one law God had given. And we're going to look at how the process of reversing that will bring us into fruitful trees and the, and the glory of God. Stan, thank you very much. It's been, uh, we promised our 
our viewers that we would have an exciting Bible discussion, and I think it was that and more. So thank you for that. Friends, this is your Bible program. We'll continue. We have three more exciting sessions around the same subject. We ask you to join us and to continue to join us as we turn to our next program where we'll focus on 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 and look at the lust of the flesh. For pamphlets and articles on this subject and other Bible subjects, go to www.thisisyourbible.com, click on the Library tab, and select from Basic Bible Teaching, Bible Study, Doctrine, Life, Prophecy, the Christadelphians. In addition to our library, thisisyourbible.com offers online Bible study courses and Bible answers to your questions. Select www.thisisyourbible.com to increase your understanding of God's Word and learn about His future kingdom on the earth. Thank you.